TPC. Welcome back, y'all. Just stand with me. Oh, Jesus. We're so thankful to be in your presence. We're so thankful to be in your house today, Lord, worshiping you together, Lord Jesus. Lord, you are welcome in this place today, Lord. I thank you for filling the house today, filling hearts and minds and bodies and spirits, Lord. You're in charge today, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Mm. And Lord, you're welcome into this holy place. worship him this morning. Lord, we love you. We appreciate you. We thank you so much, Lord. We are so thankful for you, oh God. Thank you so much. Well, God bless you all. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. You may be seated. I just have a few quick announcements to all those that are online. Thank you for tuning in and joining us this morning. Our offering designation goes to the Randolph County Ministerial Alliance Benevolence Fund. This provides food, water, shelter for local community members. So you know where our offering designations are. Also, if you picked up a Save Our Children's pledge card and you know that you have those due to turn in, please do so. If you're interested in giving, you can still do so. Just write Save Our Children on the offering envelope. And don't forget tonight, our very own Jonathan Morgans at 4 p.m., our first focus event, will be sharing some valuable information with us. So we're excited about that. So please don't miss that. He's going to be talking about some real good tools that you can put in your arsenal you're going to want to have. And also, we're going to have a corporate fast this Wednesday through Friday. Pick something to fast whatever it may be, something that maybe stretches you a little beyond your comfort zone. We'll come together on Friday at 7 for prayer to conclude our fasting. So please join us for that. And also Primrose Hill Teen Challenge. They're going to be with us on May 16th. 
we're gonna take it up an offering for them. COVID has hit them hard where they weren't able to get a lot of the support that they normally do. And so this special ministry will be with us. They're just in our backyard here in Randolph County. We wanna support them and show our love to them. I believe that's all my announcements this morning. So God bless you. Susie's gonna come and lead us in prayer. We've been praying all this month for things dealing with our mind, and we're going to continue doing that. Um, and we don't want to just pray against something. We want to ask the Lord to release something as an opposite of that. So this week we are praying against a spirit of depression, but we are asking the Lord to release a spirit of joy. If you've ever had a touch of the joy of the Lord in your spirit, Oh, there is just nothing like it in the world. Whenever you feel so dark and so heavy and the spirit of joy just comes upon you, joy because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, joy because he loves you, joy because he sees you, joy because he knows exactly where you are. There's just nothing like it. And you might know someone who deals with depression. Maybe you deal with depression yourself. So pray for those things this week because Psalm 30 and 11 says, you have turned my wailing or my mourning into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. It's, it's not just that, oh, it's a temporary thing that you have put off a spirit of depression, but Lord, you have removed that sackcloth, that spirit of mourning, and you have put a brand new outfit on me, and that outfit is joy. Aren't you thankful for the joy of the Lord? You can feel it already in this place. Thank you, Jesus. So pray for that. I'm going to give us a few needs, and then Pastor is going to come to um, explain about a situation with Bill Crabtree. He's going to lead us in prayer. Um, we want to pray this morning for Harold, who's having leg and back pain. Pray for Sister Dora, who is sick, and Sally Peterson, who's been very sick. Pray for Sister Ella, who texted this morning and said she just has a very special unspoken request that she's asking us to pray for and still recovering as well. Sister Doris, recovering from an infection. She hopefully should be coming home from the hospital today. Um, pray for a man named Richard Depry, who's going to be having colon cancer surgery on Tuesday. And then we want to pray for David and Patty Dodd, who are sick as well, and then Pastor. Thank you, Sister Susie. Um, been praying, and some of you know specifically the situation with Bill. For those of you that do not know, uh, Bill contracted COVID-19 and in a short uh, order of time uh, moved from Moberly to the University Hospital in Columbia where uh, his oxygen saturation went basically down to nothing. They had him on 100% oxygen. And uh, the, only, the only remedy that the doctors could have for him was to put him on a ventilator and induce a medical coma and medically paralyze his body to where basically his body's going to have to reset itself in order for him to bounce back and there's no guarantee that that can happen and so Bill's in a very peculiar place today and he needs a miracle literally that's what's going to have to happen to bring Bill back and so you can imagine the uh, the the gamut of emotion that uh, Alexa and Lyle and Sister Jackie have had to navigate in just a short couple of days for this to transpire as quickly as it has. And so what we're going to do today is the Bible says we're going to anoint a cloth and we're going to pray over that cloth and we're going to send that to the COVID unit at University Hospital and, and we're going to have them place that wherever Bill is. And we're going to believe that the Lord is going to perform a miracle. Amen. If you would, let's stand together at this time. And several of the needs that have been mentioned, let's pray for those as well. But I want us to pray specifically today for Bill Crabtree that the Lord would undertake for him and that the Lord would be merciful and that the Lord's will would be accomplished concerning his situation. Can you help us pray as, as I anoint this cloth? And let's pray together right now in the name of Jesus.
Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, by the power and the authority of the name that is above every name, we pray specifically for William Crabtree, God, that you would go to University Hospital where he is. Lord, that your spirit would just absolutely walk down that corridor of that hallway, Lord, that you would inv invade that COVID unit. And Lord, that your spirit would just absolutely kick open the door of his room and speak to the situation in hand. I pray, God, that your miracle working power, Lord, that your healing virtue, Lord, would speak concerning Bill Crabtree's circumstance. We commit him into your love, your mercy, your wisdom, your power, and into your authority. Lord, he is your child and he belongs to you. I pray, God, your will would be done. Lord Jesus, that your name would be glorified in what it is that you're doing in Bill Crabtree's body this day. I pray, Lord, over this cloth, God, that it would be a testament of faith to the nursing staff and to the doctors, Lord, that are there watching this situation, working this circumstance. I pray, God, that it would be a testament to his family, Lord, that you would turn it for your good, and, Lord, that your name, Jesus, would be magnified and exalted because of who you are and for what it is that you have done. We commit it to you today, and we ask it, God, in the name of Jesus Christ, let it be accomplished, let it be fulfilled, and we release it in faith this morning in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. If you believe God's doing something, why don't you give him a hand clap of praise? We're going to worship the Lord. You may be seated.
you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, he promised us that he would be a counselor. You're the mighty God and the Prince of Peace. He promised us that he would be a father. He would love us with a love that would not cease. Well, I tried him and I found his promises. They're true. <laughs> oh, he's everything he said that he would be. The finest words I know could not begin. Oh, 
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, we speak 
your name right now. We speak the name of Jesus. Can you just speak his name over a situation right now? Ooh, hallelujah. Ooh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
to be true this morning. He never fails. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He never, ever fails. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Aren't you just glad to know that you have a God who never fails? He's always on time. He always does everything perfect. That's encouraging for me. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. And if we can grab a hold of that and believe it, you know, you can hear some things, but you don't necessarily believe everything you hear. But if you can believe that, it'll get you through some of your darkest times. That God's got me no matter what it is I'm going through, no matter what it is that I'm fighting, God's got it. And if he's got it, he's got me. And we're going to make it. I mean, that's the nuts and bolts, people. I don't, I don't know anything else to say but that. You could grab a hold of that. It takes faith to believe that. That's the problem. It takes faith to really believe it. You could say you believe it, but, man, to really say that in the middle of your going through, man, that's, that's, that's a whole lot different when you're in the middle of it. And I know that some of you have been in the middle of it. And I can't tell you how excited I am to be in church today. It's such a privilege. It, it is really that. We have to count it a privilege to be here. And if you can't see that, then man, uh, uh, that's scary, man, if you can't see that. You've got to understand, it is a privilege to be in the house of God. And I'm just so very thankful to see you here this morning. For those of you joining us online, thank you for joining us. But it's just good to be in the place where God's people is, and no doubt his presence is here as well. 
If you have your Bibles, please grab them. We're going to go to Job chapter 35, verse 10, and Psalms 32 and 7. Job 35 and 10, Psalms 32 and 7. And while you're turning there, I just want to remind you, we are in the month of April talking about, of course, this year our theme is worshiping the Lord with our mind, body, and spirit. And so the Bible tells us that those are the three things we ought to love the Lord with. It's the first and greatest commandment, to love the Lord with your mind, body, and spirit. And so we are focusing on that, but this month of April is specific to the mind. And we're talking about words of adoration and just give yourself some encouragement. And so tonight, uh, our family counselor, our, our local uh, counselor, we are so very thankful to have Brother Jonathan Morgans. And so he's going to be speaking to us about mental health tonight. You don't want to miss it, 4 o'clock. So go grab, grab lunch, grab yourself a nap, and then come back here, 4 p.m., and we're going to listen to Brother Jonathan Morgans. He's going to give us some really good stuff and some tools to, uh, to use in, as we move forward in, in talking about our mind because your mind is truly the battlefield. If the enemy can get your mind, he knows the body will follow. If he can, you know, you think about anybody who is a murderer, before they ever commit it with their hand, it first develops where? In their mind. Before anybody ever commits adultery with their body, it first develops in their mind. Your mind is the battlefield in which all war is waged. And so we've got to have victory over our mind. Job chapter 35 and 10 says, But none saith, Where is God, my maker? And I want you to focus on this. Who giveth songs in the night? Anybody been in darkness? Anybody have a dark hour? Sometimes it's like you could just be going through your day, and then all of a sudden there's a solar eclipse that happens, and all of a sudden it's just darkness. (laughs) What happened to the sun, man? It was just here a minute ago. The light was shining, and then all of a sudden you're standing in darkness. I've been there. I know you've been there as well. Psalms 32 and 7, it will be on the screen behind me. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt come past me about with songs of deliverance. There's something about singing. You know, that's why we do this whole worship set thing, because there's something about music, there's something about song that just brings the presence of the Lord in. If you've never thought about this, music didn't develop over the ages in human history. Music began in heaven. So it is not of this earth. And why else would the enemy use music as a tool? He does. He uses music to, as a tool to, to influence generations of young people because there's something about music. It makes you feel a certain way. And so there's something about this, this song that we sing. And so it, during the month of April, I've been encouraging you to speak these words of affirm, affirmation to yourself and to others But, you know, sometimes our minds can be captured by the thoughts that we think. That you get something in there and you just can't get it out. Or maybe it's worries that we're faced with. We get captivated by so many things. And I just want to share with someone here today and maybe someone watching online that may be standing in the middle of a crisis. Maybe you're surrounded by darkness on every side and you can't see anything because it's just darkness. I want you to hear the voice of the Lord today. Because although you may not be able to see, you can still hear. It may be darkness all around you and your perception is limited, but you can still hear in that blinding darkness. You can still hear God's voice. And I want to speak to you for just a few minutes on this title, Victory's Voice victory's voice. Let's pray together before we're seated. Lord, I thank you for giving us, Lord, the victory. Lord, that your word declares that we are victorious. God, even before we face our battle, we have victory. Lord, before we ever face the sickness and the, and the troubles and the cares and the trials and the temptations of this world, Lord, you have already overcome. You have already given us, Lord, the victory. We have victory in you, and that's why our strength is in you. You are our rock, our shield, our buckler, our strong tower. You're everything that we lean on, Lord. It's in you that we have hope. It's in 
in you that we have healing. It's in you that we have power. It's in you that we have salvation. Everything that we need, Lord, we find it in you. And I thank you for who you are and for what you do for us. In Jesus' name, God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. A pastor boarded an airplane and sits down next to a gentleman as he, as the standard thing happens. If anybody's ever flown before, you know what this looks like. You sit down, you get your seat, and you're sitting there. And if you're sitting by someone that you're not familiar with, you start to open up that conversation and that dialogue with that person. You know, like, hey, you know, where are you from? What do you do for a living? You know, you just doing a little something. It's just a, a, it's almost like a common courtesy just to have a little bit of conversation because we're going to be sitting next to each other for a couple hours here. We might as well just kind of get to know each other and get familiar with one another. And you, you, you do that because that conversation is, it's like supposed to happen. I don't know. It's just like an unspoken thing. Anybody ever done that before? You had those conversations, you know, and. And so this pastor gets on this plane, and he has this conversation with this man. And the man asks him, well, what do you do? And the preacher said, well, I'm a pastor. And the man said, well, that's kind of unique. I fly a lot, and I don't often come across a pastor. And, and what kind of church do you pastor in? And he, res he responded to him, I'm a pastor of a Pentecostal church. And as soon as he said those words... The man turns and looks out the window with this distant stare and a funny look inside of his eye, and he says, it's been a long, long time. So the pastor asked, did you used to attend a Pentecostal church? The man said, no, I've never went to church growing up. The pastor, pastor then asked him, do you, do you have any family that attend a Pentecostal church and the man said, no, I don't have any family that go to church at all. Well, do you know someone? Have you read about this? Have you seen a movie? I mean, come on, man. Give me something to work with here. The pastor's reaching for him. And, and, and what do you mean that it's been a long, long time? And the guy says to him as he turns back away from the window, well, I have something in my background that is quite unique, and it's a unique story, and I'm sure it's far different than anything that you've come across before, Pastor. It was at this time time that the man began to confide and open up to this pastor of how he was a POW in North Vietnam. He was a pilot whose plane was shot down, and he tried to escape his capture, but he was captured, and he was moved around and about throughout Vietnam until he landed in a place that is infa inf 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 infamously, let me get that word out. I could spell it, but I just can't say it. Uh, he, it's infamous, this place called the Hanai Hilton. Uh, Hanai Hilton, it is a place, a prison camp in Vietnam that was famous for its cruelty, and and torture techniques. Whenever you got into northern Vietnam, that's that you are in the heart of the beast. There, you are far from South Vietnam. You're, you're you're far away from the help that you need. And there he found himself in his story. And he begins to tell him. He said, "I went through things that are absolutely horrific for me to tell you today, Pastor. I don't care what the histor history revisionist writes or what the propaganda says about it. I went through things in that place that." will wake me up in the middle of the night in cold sweats. I had joints that were dislocated in my body. I was shocked with electric cords. I was beaten and kept in a little cage where I couldn't even stand up. I was fed rancid bowls of soup that would make anybody's stomach turn. But it was just enough to keep me alive, but never enough to satisfy the hunger pains that I had every single day of my existence in those camps. And my only companion were the rats and the fleas and the lice that were in my hair that, that entered my cage. Those things that would come in, those rodents and those pests kept me company throughout those many, many months that I was there. It was a horrific ordeal that I wouldn't even wish on my worst enemy. But he said, just down the way from me, 
In his own little cage was this Pentecostal man. I never knew his name because if you gave that kind of information, they figured you would be willing to forfeit more information. And the abuse would never stop until they got tired of trying. And so we tried hard not to know too much about each other because of the condition that we were in. So I never knew his name. I never found out where he was from. In fact, I never even laid eyes on the man. I never saw him. I just heard him. The pastor stopped him and he asked him the question, if you never knew his name and you never knew where he was from and you never saw this man or even you didn't even know what branch of the service he was in, how in God's name were you able to know anything about his religious affiliation? And the man said, I'll tell you how. It's because there was something different and unique about this guy. Every night just before it got dark out, no matter how they may have beaten him, no matter what they may have abused him with, or how alone he may have felt, no matter how much the enemy told him that he would never get out of this place, no matter what he had gone through that day, every night as it began to get dark, you could hear that man as he began to sing. And he would sing songs that were about Pentecost and how God saved his soul. He would sing all these different songs. And I still remember, preacher, one particular song that he sang. And I don't know if you have ever heard about it or not, but it was called Victory in Jesus. He asked him, do you know that one, preacher? And he says, oh, yeah, I know that one. We still sing that in my church today. I, I know that one. And with tears streaming down his face, the man said, I never knew his real name. I never knew where he was from. But I'll tell you that what we called him, we called him victory. We called him victory, and it was at this point that the man turned to that Pentecostal pastor, and he said, Preacher, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you believe or where you preach, but this one thing I do know, and that is that victory had a God because victory just kept on singing. When everybody else was silent, victory would have a song to sing, and he would encourage us in that northern Vietnam campground. I'm telling you the story, and I've come here to encourage somebody here today that might be going through a tough experience. You're going through something today, and your enemy might have been telling you, hey, it's no good. It's all over. You're never going to get out of this place that you find yourself locked up in. It's hopeless. But I've got good news for you this morning because in the nighttime hours, you still have a God. When the lights go out, you still have a God. God is your God. Victory still has a God, and that God gives you a song in the night. He gives you a song in the middle of the darkness. I'm trying to help somebody here today. You may feel like a prisoner. You may feel like you're locked up inside of hurt and confusion. You may, may feel bruised. You may feel afflicted in some way. You may be living in the, at the gates of hell itself, but you may be enduring some of the enemy's attack even. But I've got good news for you today. I've come here to tell you, you still have a name that the enemy can't strip away from you. You still have an identity that the enemy can't take from you. You still have an identity that no earthly trial can rob you of. Your identity is in the Lord Jesus Christ and that, my friend, cannot be taken away from you. Hear my words this morning. You are a conqueror. We're talking about words of affirmation. You are a conqueror. You are a champion. You are a victor. You can make it. You got more going for you than you have against you today. How about this? God is on your side. No matter how dark it may get, I can hear victory's voice piercing my midnight mindset. I can hear the song in the night. If you've ever been there, you know what I'm talking about. When you're in that place of lowliness, you're in that place where you just feel like you've hit rock bottom, and all of a sudden, in the middle of your darkest hour, there's a song that comes to you, and you begin to encourage yourself in the Lord because there's something about the song that comes in the midnight hour. 
You need to let it ring from here to hell and pack. Devil, you thought you had won by shutting down my praise for a little while. You thought I was going to quit, but let's get this thing straight right now. Through Jesus Christ, I have the victory, and I still have a God, and I still got a song because God has never failed me. He never has. He never will. He'll always be by my side. It is a matter where I may find myself in this time, in this you know, on this spectrum of the life. I'm not going to be left alone. God is here with me. I dare somebody to frustrate hell right now. I dare you. Oh yeah, that's that's frustrating to do. Hell hates it when you do that. He hates it because he thought you were down. He thought you were out. He thought you, he, he had put you through enough, but you're still here. You're still here. Sister Terry, you're still here. You've been through a lot. You found yourself on death's door in a hospital. I, I love your testimony of how God brought you from the gates of death itself and brought you back. And you're still here. Look at us, all of us. We're still here. We're still in this. You say, well, I hurt. Well, only survivors hurt. <laughs> Think about that statement. Only survivors hurt. If you're hurting today, that's a good sign that you're still in the game. You're not dead. That means you're alive. <laughs> I know that's funny, but you know what? It's true. It's true. Survivors hurt. You know what? Some of us, we can easily, it, it could be very easy to come to church and sit down and start sucking our thumb and start dwelling on how big our problems are, but but we're here, and, and we're here today, and we, we've come together again, uh, and we, we're here to celebrate how big our God is because we, we, we can choose to believe the report of unbelief, or we could decide that there's a God who is still in, in the business of giving us songs in the middle of the midnight hour. God is still in the business of giving us the victory. You know, the devil thought he could take you out. He thought he could somehow shut this thing down. But I beg to differ because my name is Victory. And I still got a God. My name is Victory and I still got a God. You better come to terms with the fact that I have a name and an identity that can be taken away from me. My name is Victory and I can sing in the middle of the darkest night. I can sing when I'm sick. I can sing when I'm weary. I can sing when I'm discouraged. My name is Victory and although I may be in the darkness now, you can count on me to still be singing whenever the sun comes up because yeah, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning because my God gives me songs in the night. I'm convinced that victory is God's plan for every one of us. I refuse to believe that it's God's will for his people to feel beat up all the time. That we're somehow, that we ought to, we're going to somehow be second place in a two-horse race. I don't think that's God's will at all. I read things in Scripture that say things like, I will make you the head and not the tail. I read where the enemy will come against you one way, but he's going to flee from you seven different directions because God's given you the victory. I read where it says, thanks be unto God who causes us to always triumph. I'm not saying there will never be hard days. There will be hard days. Now, I'm not saying that you're never going to go through some stuff. There are going to be some dark and sad times in life. There are going to be times of weeping. There's going to be times of mourning. There's going to be times of loss. But what I'm saying here today is that right in the middle of all that, there's still going to be a song. In the midst of all my sickness, there's still a song. In the midst of sorrow, there's a song. In the midst of temptation, there's a song. In the middle of my grief, there is a song. And in the middle of my dilemma, yeah, you got it, still a song. Somebody here today needs to reach out through the darkness that you have been living through and say this one thing I know, victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory is mine today. 
Some of us know that old song. It doesn't make any sense to come to church and leave the same way you walked in. If you walked in here feeling defeated, you need to walk out of here with victory this morning. Victory showed up in the middle of your darkness. You got your dark cloud around you. That's okay. It's okay for you to have a dark cloud around you because victory's still there. Something needs to get a hold of you today that convinces you that today is the day that you're going to get a, your dance back in your feet. You know, I think about that. I think about, you know, just what motivates us to get to the point to where we just feel like, mm. You think about it. Most of us right now, you wouldn't start dancing right now. But if we started singing your song, so tapping foot, I don't know, This for some of us, this is as good as it gets. And so whatever you got, that's all I say, whatever you got. And so you, you see, the, it's the song that motivates us. You need to start hearing victory song. God has victory for you this morning. You need to understand that you need to reach out through that darkness and tell yourself victory is mine. Something needs to get a hold of you today that convinces you that today is the day you're going to get that dance back into your feet. I'm not leaving this place depressed. I'm not leaving this place suicidal. I'm not leaving this place with anxiety. I'm not leaving this place with depression. I'm not leaving this place because why? Because I've got a God. That's why. You got a problem? You got a God. You have sickness? Well, you got a God. You got a broken heart? You got a God. You have a dire situation? I'll tell you what you have. You've got a song in the midnight hour that lets you rejoice no matter what it is that you're going through today. You have a God who is on your side. I didn't say that I'll always be feeling victorious. I heard times where we don't feel victory. <laughs> Can I get an amen on that one? I mean, come on. There's times where we don't feel victorious. But just because we don't feel victorious doesn't mean that we have to feel victorious to be victorious. You don't have to feel that way to be that way. Yeah, that's, that's where the midnight hour song comes in because I may feel like I'm defeated, but that doesn't mean that I'm defeated. I may feel like I have, uh, I have failed in some way, but that doesn't mean that I am a failure. It just simply means that I don't feel the way that I really am promised to be. Psalms 90, 81, oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him, him, the victory. The victory belongs to God, and if God is on your side, then do the math. That lets me know that he has already won the victory and it's already been acquired. Listen to me whenever I tell you that as a blood-washed, born-again believer, victory is your reality. It is not your reaction. Victory is your status. It's not your situation. Victory is your inheritance. It's not your emotions. Victory is, is not your mood. It's your birthright. As a believer, it is your birthright. 2 Corinthians 2 and 14, now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 and 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If victory only comes through Jesus. Don't you understand? Are you putting it together? The only way you have victory today is because of him. The only way you're going to get victory in your circumstance is through him. The only way you can be, be saved from your sin is because of him. It's through Jesus Christ that we have the victory. I can't conquer this addiction, but he can. I can't fight this disease, but he can. I can't fight this battle, but he can. I can't see my way through this fog in my life, but he can. I can't reach my backslidden children. I know you can't, but he can. I can't forgive the sin that I have in my life. That's okay. He can. I can mend my emotions, but he can. I can't fix my marriage, but he can. And if you believe that, then you know what we have to do. We have to sing 
when we are discouraged. We have to sing when we're weary. Sing when you're tired. Sing when you're hurt. Sing when you're broken. Oh, man, I, I know what that's like. Sing when you're, when you're under attack. Sing when it's hopeless because you can't fix it. But you do know that he can, and that's why you sing. Sing because although you can't do it, you know that God can. When you're down, sing. When you're discouraged, sing. When you're tempted, sing. When you feel broken, sing. When you're confused, sing. When all hell breaks loose in your life, get that song going. Why should I sing when I fall so short of the glory of God? Why should I sing whenever I have failed and fallen in my faith? It's because the scriptures have already told me that when you fall, that it's the wrong time for the enemy to be singing. Somebody needs to sing. And, and when you're at your lowest point and you have fallen short of the glory of God and you feel like you have failed, that's when you need to sing the most. Micah 7 and 8. Rejoice. That's a, that's a word that denotes singing. If you want to reread that, another translation says, sing not against me. Don't celebrate where I am right now. Rejoice or sing not against me, O my enemy, because when I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Somebody needs to rejoice for the light that comes in the midst of the darkness. <laughs> Hallelujah. I thank you, Jesus, for the song in the night. Thank you, Lord, for what it is you give us. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Bible gives us an illustration of this with Paul and Silas in jail at Philippi. And so we, we see that story. Many of you may be familiar with that and that they were jailed because of their faith. They were bound up in a dark uh, chamber inside, deep inside of a prison. They were chained up in darkness. Chained, but not just chained, chained in darkness. They were imprisoned in a dark place. But in the middle of the night, they began to sing praises unto the Lord. They began to sing praises into the Lord because dark, isn't it funny? In the darkness, victory song shows up. If you have faith, victory song is going to show up. That's why it's always encouraging whenever other people go through dark experiences with you and you have, a, and you have faith. Faith elevates the victory song and so they can hear that song. They're, it's like they're in the POW camp with you. You just happen to be the one who's singing. Nobody else is saying a word, but they're listening to what you're doing whenever you're going through the same thing they're going through. Amen. Psalms 32 and 7. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt come past me about with songs of deliverance. Here's a thought, and I was thinking about this in regards to where they were and, and the events that happened because the Bible says that that they began, they were locked up, they began to sing, and at midnight, that's the darkest hour, at midnight, the jail was shaken, and everybody's chains were loose, all, all the stocks and bonds that they were in were, fell off, and all the doors come open, and, and everybody was free. And I thought about this, that, you know what, it, it was at midnight that that happened. In other words, it may not be dark enough for your song to have its effect yet. Think about that. That it, it, had, it, it wasn't 9 o'clock when, when the, the, the jail was shaken. 
It wasn't even at the 11th hour that the jail was shaken. But it was at the darkest point of the evening that God decided, hey, I like what it is that I'm hearing from you in the midst of the darkest hour of your experiences right now, Paul and Silas. I like what it is that I hear. And I, I'm just kind of convinced. I, I'm just going to be a little abstract here for just a second. That whenever they began to sing the song of praise, I don't know what they were singing. Maybe they were singing victory in Jesus. I don't know what they were singing. But they were singing a song of praise. And as they begin to sing the song of praise, that God just began to tap his foot. It's a good song. Good song. I like that. Because when God started tapping his foot, what started happening? All of a sudden, the earth began to quake. Because there's something happening whenever I begin to sing in my midnight hour. When I begin to sing the song of victory that, God, you've been so good. God, you have been faithful. Whenever I begin to sing, all of a sudden, God starts tapping his foot to your song. And all of a sudden, God begins to shake up your circumstance because God can release you from your bondage when you sing at the midnight hour. If you would like God to put his foot down in your situation... You got to give him something to pat his foot to. <laughs> For some of us, that's hard. But you know what? The Lord loves all kinds of music. He's the author of all that. You know that, right? And so if we'll just sing him a song, it doesn't have to be beautiful. The Bible just simply says, make a joyful noise. It doesn't have to be on key. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be a noise, but not just a noise, a joyful one. And if I could just start to sing, just reach down inside the depths of yourself and just begin to sing a song of praise of God, you've been so faithful. All my life, you've been faithful and good to me. When you begin to sing that and start to just give that back to God, God says, man, that's, some, that's good foot stomping stuff. I don't feel joy. Well, that's because joy comes in the morning. But the song comes at midnight. It's the song that keeps me going until the joy comes back. You know, a lot of people say they want to live, and their goal in life is to live and be happy all the time. If happiness is something that is the coup de gras of your life that you're always seeking for and some destination that you think that you're going to arrive at and you're going to be able to stay there indefinitely, you are so, we need to talk. Because life is full of struggle. Life is so full of malevolence and tragedy. It, life is hard. Life is loss. Life is all of this. But the Lord breathes upon our life. And in moments, and they, they, they may not last very long, but when those moments happen, that happiness just kind of creeps in. All of a sudden, the clouds just kind of part, and the sun just kind of shines down. That's when we stop. And you enjoy that moment of happiness while you still have it. Because you know that the clouds are going to come together again. And I'm going to have to keep going on. But that's why we got a song. Because when you have a song, you can sing it when the sun is not shining. When you have a song, you can sing it whenever the clouds fade away and darkness envelops the earth around you. You can sing that song because you know eventually there's going to be a day when the sun is coming up. Yeah, the sun goes down, but the God has been faithful. And that lets me know that the sun, if it went down, then it's going to come back up in the morning and I can sing until I see the morning light. Let's stand together if you would. Psalms 137 and 1. It's given the 
it's kind of tapping into an Old Testament story in the book of Ezekiel, talking about the occupation of Israel, and they were taken captive and taken away into the Babylon. But Psalms, the writer David is writing about this, and he writes in Psalms 137, he said, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. They were thinking about where they could be in relationship to where they were. And verse 2 says, We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. In other words, the enemy was taunting them, saying, Where's Zion at now? Sing us one of your songs now. And the Bible says, They considered their circumstance, and they hung their harp up. For somebody here, maybe listening online, watching online, and maybe somebody under the sound of my voice here today, that the devil has spoken that lie to you and has got you to look at your problem and convinced you to hang your harp up. You know what your harp represents? It represents praise. It represents music. It represents victory song and he's taunting you today saying sing that victory song now because I got you so locked up but I'm here to tell you here's the thing it says that we hung up our harps not the Babylonians we did that we chose to hang our harps up and if we chose to hang them up then it also means that we can choose to go back and pick them up again and if you've hung your harp up and you don't have a victory song this morning, I'm encouraging you in the Holy Ghost to go to the willow and pick up that harp again and begin to sing the song of Zion for yourself because whenever you do, God's going to start doing something. God's going to start working it out. God is the author and the finisher of our faith, the Bible says. And if he's the author and the finisher of our faith, that means God begins to write for us a new song. God's the author of our song. He's the author of our songbook. He begins to become a songwriter for us whenever we get ourselves out of the mully grubs and start deciding that I'm going to make a choice to rejoice in him today. And so this morning, I wonder who's got a song. Where's the victory song at for you? Has it died and has it gone to the willow tree or is that a harp in your hand? You're saying, man, you know what? Life isn't as bad as I thought it was. I feel like I could, I could play something right now. I feel, I feel like I got a song coming on. If that's where you feel like you are this morning, I'm going to invite you to come forward as an act of faith. You're going to just, just come forward and just give that song to the Lord. Whatever it may be, it may be a song of prayer. It may be a song of praise. It may be a song of dance. It may, there's a, some form of rejoicing that needs to happen inside of you because when you do, God begins to change the situation. You give God what it is that he needs this morning. Give him something to tap his foot to. Give something that God can shake the foundation of your captivity about. There's a, there's a victory song in the midnight hour right now for you. All you got to do is reach out and sing it. All you got to do is reach out in faith, grab a hold of that harp and say, God, I'm going to give you the glory because you've been faithful. Oh, Jesus. Jesus.